Welcome. We return again together to create a beloved community, acting together with compassion, reason, and respect, empowering us to promote a just society. We first want to acknowledge that here in the CSRA, we reside on the lands of the Westo people, the Savannah Shawnees, the Yuki peoples of the Muskogee Confederacy. I'm Jenea Filzen, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm helping to support the worship team today with our worship leader, Chris Garcia, musician, Robin Macy, the wonderful team on the tech deck, and of course, all of you. We welcome you here, especially our visitors. We will know you by your orange name tags, and we hope that you feel welcome here today. We invite you to look for a blue card in a seat pocket near you and fill that out. It will make it easier for us to keep in touch with you and for you to find out more about what's happening here. Please say hi after the service during our coffee hour. Uh, we'll all meet together to enjoy some coffee and snacks. And then after that, at 1230, back in here, we'll have a discussion uh, led by Chris about the uh, reflection today. Whether you're here for the first time or the thousandth, I sincerely hope you get what you need today. Now, there's a lot of announcements. <laughs> um, we have a lot of very, very cool things happening coming up. Um, this Wednesday, I'm really excited to announce um, October 5th, 7.30 here, uh, we're going to be doing an ecstatic dance program. Um, there's more information on an event in Realm. There's a Facebook event as well. Um, and you can also look at a new uh, page on the website that talks about ecstatic dance and all of its benefits. Um, if you are on Facebook, please, please find the event and share it. Uh, we would love for people to be able to, to come out and enjoy this uh, from throughout the community. We have a final call for folks to complete the Soul Circles survey. Um, it's been emailed to everyone and included in the e-announcements, so please fill out that survey. If you've offered items or services in last year's auction, please look for an email from the auction team to ensure that you're following through on that contribution. If the auction is to be the annual community sustaining function that we hope it will be, folks need to depend on receiving that for which they've paid. Uh, there are other ways that you can continue to help and contribute to this uh, wonderful community. There will be a church grounds cleanup happening this Saturday morning, October 8th, from 9.30 to 12.30, and we will provide some delicious pizza after everyone gets that work done. It's a great way to connect and serve. Um, if you have any questions, you can, you can look for someone in the grounds committee. Um, on October 13th at 5.15 p.m., the social justice team is inviting folks to help them write postcards to Georgia voters, and then we'll be mailing them out. Um, I did some of this as well. It's very simple. You have the message there. You can kind of make it your own with all of the key information, fill out the postcards, and then mail them out. It's very important work. So we hope that uh, many of you will be able to come out again October 13th, 515, um, to help to promote democracy um, in this very important state of Georgia. The membership team and Reverend Nick are working on some ideas to let folks who would like to become members know more about what Unitarian Universalism is all about. Especially for you new-ish folks, keep an eye out for more information. And if we have been seeing you for a while, we might just invite you to, <laughs> to join us directly at some point. I'm not quite done, so more. Um, <laughs> Now this is another really, really exciting piece uh, that's going to be happening here um, in our community again, and some of you will know about it. Jazz concerts are coming back. Yay. <laughs> 
So we're going to begin with a jazz trio of singer Kat Galen, guitarist Kyle Bryant, and Travis Shaw on upright bass on October 28th at 7.30 p.m. Tickets will be $20 or $10 for students and military. And there is more information um, about how you can help out financially or as a volunteer in the recent e-announcement or the Octo October newsletter. Um, and as with Ecstatic Dance, it would be really great if you shared this with um, anyone you think would be interested in joining uh, these great events. Um, and now Board President Natalie Reese has another important announcement to share. Good morning. I just want to um, start the excitement that on November 6th, we're going to have a special congregational meeting right after the service, so at 1230, to vote to call Reverend Nick as our settled minister. Two things. We need 50% of the congregation to have a quorum. Usually it's 25, so 50%. It's going to be hybrid. It's gonna have, we're going to have it here in the sanctuary. We'll put it on Zoom, and um, proxy votes do count towards our quorum. I don't have the paperwork ready for that yet. I will definitely have it by next Sunday. Um, and then within that 50% quorum, we have to have a 90% yes vote for it to pass. So it's super, super important for people to show up and to show their support. And I don't know why anybody would vote no, but we need 90% yes. Otherwise, uh, there's like 15 minister positions around the, uh, around the United States for UU churches that are vacant. So there's... There's nobody else out there. Plus, why would we want that? <laughs> if you have any questions, again, I'm Natalie Reese. Um, reach out in any way you would like. Thank you, Natalie. So with that, we're going to take a moment, take a deep breath, think about all of the amazing things that are happening right here, and now we'll have a time to, to enter into worship together. The chalice lighting today is Invitation to Bold Space by Beth Strano by way of Mickey Scott Bay Jones. Together, we will create bold space because there's no such thing as safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our bold space together, and we will work on it side by side. Would you please join us in body or spirit as we sing All My Memories of Love, hymn 336.
Good morning. I'm Margaret Tuck, member of the pastoral care team. This is a traditional time in our service where you are invited to come up here, stand beside me, take the microphone, introduce yourself and share those joys and sorrows which you want to talk about this morning. Well, hello everyone. Um, now we're going to have our story for all ages. So I would like for any young people or old people who identify as children, <laughs> come on up, have a seat, and we're going to have a story. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Come one, come all. Let's have a seat, baby. There you go, sweetie. <laughs> All right, so our story today is Anansi and the Box of Stories, okay? So a little background, everybody. Anansi stories are trickster folk tales, and they hail from the Ashanti and Akan people in Ghana. And from there, the story spread through West Africa and to the, and to the Caribbean. All right, here we go. Anansi the spider was a trickster cunning and crafty. He would weave with words as well as with webs. So when he looked at the world, he knew that something was missing. Stories. Not the stories he spun full of fantastic lies and clever deceits, but stories to be told around a fire to ward off the darkness at night. Stories to spark the imagination and breathe life into the unknown, to be told to children before they fell asleep, and then to be passed on from father to son and mother to daughter, and on and on and on. And where were all these stories? A Nazi knew full well where they were, with Naomi, the sky god, locked in a wooden box. But would Naomi give the box to the people? Never. He guarded it like a hawk and never let it far from his reach. Many had tried before and all had failed. If a Nazi were to win over that brimming box of stories, he was going to have to use all of his cunning. And he couldn't wait. A Nazi began to spin a great long thread as long and strong as the rivers that roared through the forest. He made it reach all the way to the sky, and then on eight grasping legs, he scampered up it, up and up, until he reached the heavens. Oh, Naomi, said Anansi, bowing low before the sky god, I have come for the box of stories. Would you be so gracious as to give it to me? When Naomi's whole body rocked with laughter, he said, oh, Anansi, he mocked. Only you would be bold and brave enough to ask for it. But my answer, of course, is no. But you must have a price, replied a Nazi. Everyone has a price. What is yours? Well, Naomi was silent for a while, delighting in thinking up impossible requests that were sure to defeat the spider. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one, he thought. And then, oh yes, this is even better. Are you absolutely sure you want to know my price? I'm sure, said Anansi. Well, many have tried, warned Naomi, and all have failed. These are hard tasks for a little spider. Anansi was, was not so easily scared. Name your price, he insisted. Very well, said Naomi. Bring me Onini the python. Osibo the leopard and Emboro the hive of hornets. Oh, and uh, let me see one more thing. I think. Ah, uh, yes, 
and Moshe, then and only then will the box be yours. Mm -mm -mm -mm, Moshe, stuttered Anansi, his eight legs trembling. In all of Africa, everyone feared Onini, who could squeeze the life from a crocodile. Crocodile. People dreaded meeting Osibo, whose claws were sharper than knives, and Emboro, whose stings burned hotter than the sun. But no one was feared more than Emosha, the invisible, bad-tempered spirit of the forest. But I'll do it, Anansi swore. I can succeed where others fail. I can be the one to unlock the box of stories. So Anansi slid down the thread all the way down to earth, plotting and planning as he went. First, he decided it was the turn of Onini, the python. Early the next morning, Anansi headed for the forest, a long stick clutched in his claws. He scuttled under the biggest tree of them all, and beneath its swaying branches, he began to talk to himself. I know I'm right, he muttered. I know I am. He is much longer than this stick. Why will no one believe me? A long, lithe body uncoiled itself from the branch above and slithered down until it was head high with a Nazi. said Onini the python. What is this you are talking about, Anansi? And you have woken me from my slumbers. How dare you? Oh, Nini, I'm so sorry, groveled Anansi. I didn't see you there. I have been telling everyone how long you are, how you are the longest and greatest snake in the forest. I've said you are even longer than this huge stick, but not a single animal will believe me. <laughs> Fools, said the snake, this is easily sorted. Let me lay myself out along the ground. Then I will prove that I am the greatest. I'll make this stick look like nothing more than a twig beside me. Then the great Onini slid down from the tree and stretched himself out along the stick. Anansi worked like lightning, darting this way and that, spinning his silken thread around the python until he was trapped fast against the stick. What trick is this? He hissed Anini angrily, trying to thrash his body free from the thread, but nothing could break, break Anansi's web. Ha, said Anansi, now come with me. And he carried Onini up into the sky and presented him with a flourish to Nayami. The sky, looked, the sky god looked on haughtily. I'm not worried, little spider, he declared. You still have the leopard and the hornets to catch. And of course, in Momosha. Anansi spun himself down from the sky and spent the day wrapped in thought. He had captured Onini by playing on his pride. Surely he could do the same with Osibo the leopard. The next day, Anansi waltzed over to where the sleek leopard was sunning himself on a large flat rock. Anansi had a sack slung over his shoulder, and yet again, he was talking to himself. A leopard will never manage it. I told them once, I told them twice. He could never, ever do it. But would they believe me? No, they would not. What's this, Anansi, said Osibo, yawning and stretching himself out to his full length. Anansi caught a glimpse of Osibo's long knife-like claws unsheathed and glinting in the sun. They would cut him in two for, in a moment, he knew, but he bravely carried on. I was talking to the other animals in the forest. I was saying how clever and cunning you are, but how even you couldn't squeeze yourself into this sack. But everyone else seemed to think you could. Ha, said Osibo. Let me prove you wrong. Hold open that sack and I'll be inside in the blink of an eye. Suppressing his smile, Anansi held open the sack. Osibo leaped inside, and Anansi bound it shut with his silken threads. Osibo kicked, and he clawed, and he squirmed, but there was nothing he could do break for, to break free from the sack. You trickster, Osibo cried. I should have known better than to trust a spider. 
So you should, said Anansi, but it's too late now. And once again, he strung his threads up to the sky and presented Osibo to the sky god. Two more to go, said Naomi. That box of stories is still far from being yours. And Anansi knew it. Now he had, had to trap a hive of stinging hornets and carry them up to the sky. How was he going to do this? And after two nights of plotting and planning, a Nazi could be found with a large gourd full of water and a plantain leaf standing beneath the hornet's hive. They were buzzing furiously. A Nazi thought for a moment of their poker hot stings, and then he thought of the box of stories brimming with unspoken words. He scuttled up the branch above the hornet's nest and poured the water from the gourd all over it. Then he scuttled down again, a dripping plantain leaf perched upon his head. What's this? cried the hornets angrily. It's not the rainy season. Where has this water come from? Oh, and Boros, said Anansi, I thought you would not be prepared for this sudden downpour. Look, I have come with a gourd so that you may take shelter inside it. Thank you, said the hornets, and they buzzed out of their hive and into the ground. As soon as the last one had passed through the opening, a Nazi placed the plantain leaf over the hole and bound it on with his strongest silk. Then he went up to the sky god the gourd thrumming angrily with a mass of furious hornets. Hmm, said Naomi. And still I'm not worried, for, all, for as we all know, Emosha will be the hardest of all to catch. Anansi did know this, and he spent many days and nights pondering the problem. How to trap something he couldn't even see. At last, he came up with a plan. He carved a little wooden doll and covered it with sticky sap from a gum tree. Then he went and hid it deep in the forest, in the place he knew Emosha loved to be. And then he chose a hiding place beneath a canopy of leaves, and he watched and he waited. There was a rustling of leaves, but nothing to be seen. The rustling grew louder and came closer. Anansi felt a brush of wind against his cheek, and then he heard a voice, the voice of Mimosha. Why won't you talk to me? The voice hissed. Anansi whipped around. Was Mimosha talking to him? And then the voice came again. How dare you be so rude? With relief, Anansi realized his trick was working, and Moshe was talking to the wooden doll. I said, speak to me, shrieked Mimosha. And at that moment, Anansi saw the doll's head move. Something, or rather someone, had touched it, and whoever had touched it was clearly stuck to it. What's going on, said Mimosha. Then the whole doll was moving. It looked like Mimosha had both hands stuck to it. Anansi leaped from his hiding place and strung his spider silk around Mimosha and the doll as hard and fast as he could until he had wrapped her in a cocoon. Let me go, let me go, cried the fierce Mimosha. Never, cried Anansi, for now I will have paid my price. He tucked Mimosha under one of his arms and slid whooping with joy up to the sky god on his skein of silk. So you have done it, said Naomi, and the sky god is not one to break his word. He handed over the box of stories and Anansi took it with him all the way back to earth. He looked at it for a moment. It was nothing but a carved wooden box, no different from any other box. What would lie inside? He flipped open the lid with one of his legs and out spilled the stories. Word upon word, filling the air with their hum, they spun out and beyond to the ears of men, and Anansi knew nothing would ever be the same again. He had given stories to the world. All right. 
All right, everyone. So now we're, we're going to sing out our kids to continue their faith formation with our family ministry facilitators. I'm going to try uh, to keep this meditation short, which is really difficult for me. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out for the meditation group tomorrow here. I unlock the door at 6.30. It goes from 7 until 8. Uh, come in through the kitchen door if you have an interest in this. If you're an experienced meditator, you can groove with the group energy. If you don't know how to meditate, we will teach you. I will teach you how to meditate, what it really is. Thank you. Uh, very simple meditation. I'll begin it by ringing the bell. Uh, Robin will end it with her piano. Uh, this is a very simple question. But what you should understand is that behind this question, which seems childishly simple, there is a whole world of metaphysics and theology that people spend their whole life trying to answer. The question is simply this, who are you? Now, you may say, oh, well, I'm, I, I'm a school teacher, I work for the army. I, no, that is incidental. That is incidental. Oh, oh really? Oh, oh. That is. Noah, build me an ark. It works. All right. Um, what? Who are you? Who are you? So the question is, who is the experiencer? Not the labels that you define yourself with. Those are incidental. Who are you? Who is the person sitting in this chair experiencing this moment? Who are you? So I was considering a, an invitation to generosity and um, an object lesson came to mind of a person who was in a great big hall and before them there was a, a banquet table um, laid out with the, the dishes, with food, with everything that you can imagine. Um, and they wanted to find a way to to move this big, great table um, to make it more uh, accessible to people. It was kind of tucked away in a corner, even though it was all laid out. They wanted it to be really in the center of the room with all the lights shining down on it. 
And so they went to a, a corner of the table and started to pull, and it didn't budge. Um, it was a solid, sturdy, large table. They weren't able to move it at all. Um, and so they went and found a friend and brought them to the table and said, can, can you help me move this? Um, the friend went on one side, they went on the other side, and they tried to pull it again. You know, they were able to shake the dishes a little bit, move some things a little bit, but it wasn't going anywhere. Um, so they decided, you know, we need some more people here um, if we're going to be able to actually uh, change this situation. We, we need help. Um, so they went out again, and they invited more people into this banquet hall. They said, please help us. We want to we wanna move this, um, and there will be enough for everyone to enjoy once we're done. So as more and more people came streaming in, they lined up around the table, and they each lifted right from where they were um, and started walking with the table. And they marveled at the fact that it didn't feel heavy at all. Um, with so many people around, uh, it was easy to lift and move the table. Um, they put it where they needed it to go, and they all feasted on the, on the banquet that was there provided for them. Um, and that's something that uh, rings true in, I would say, almost every situation I can imagine. Um, it's sometimes hard to do things on your own. It's hard to lift things. It's hard to bear the weight and the burden of some things on your own. We need each other, and with the help of everyone, it's easier to bear. It's easier to make these changes. Um, and here in this community, we're trying to make some big changes. We're dismantling systems. We are changing the, uh, the foundation that certain things are built on. We're, we're really trying to move things in a different direction. Um, we need everyone's help, but you don't have to move it all yourself. Contributing a little bit really makes the huge difference. We can move mountains if we all lift a little bit at a time. Can the ushers please come forward? Thank you for your generosity. So, this one, huh? Okay. This works? No, it doesn't. It worked in rehearsal, folks. <laughs> Hello? All right. Good. What I want to talk about this morning is the power of narrative and how it is used to influence us. I want to have a chance to read from a couple of books that I really love. These are books I've loved all my life. This first passage is from a book called The Last Temptation of Christ. This is the only novel that ever made me put the book down and cry. This is an amazing book. Last Temptation of Christ uh, simply refers to the temptation to be an ordinary man. If you're a man of destiny, <clears throat> if you know things are probably going to turn out bad for you, the temptation is to turn away from it. A good example might be President Zelensky in Ukraine. They offered him early on a chance to evacuate from the country. He said, I don't need a ride, I need bullets. That's what it means to turn away from the last temptation of Christ. In this scene, Martin Scorsese made a very good movie of this book. It's very faithful. If you don't want to read the book, you can see the movie. 
In this scene, Jesus, who has been living an ordinary life and enjoying it a lot, is walking through a village square with his wife and his mother and the children, and they're walking through the square, uh, a father parading his family, which is what you should do and they enjoy. And he hears a man on a street corner preaching about the crucified and resurrected Jesus, <clears throat> and it makes him furious. Liar, liar, he shouted. I am Jesus of Nazareth, and I was never crucified, never resurrected. I am the son of Mary and Joseph the carpenter of Nazareth. I am not the son of God. I am the son of man like everyone else. What blasphemies you utter. What effronteries, what lies. Is it with these kind of lies, you swindler, that you're going to save the world? You? You? Paul, bewildered, said, while, while Jesus spoke, he rolled his eyes. Jesus said, why are you rolling your eyes? Why do you stare at my hands and feet? Those remarks were stamped to me by God during my sleep. And they go on. And he says, now it is time's, Paul's time to explode. Shut your mouth, he shouted, rushing at Jesus. Be quiet. Our men will hear you and die of fright in the rottenness, in the injustice and poverty of this world. The crucified and resurrected Jesus has been the one precious consolation for the honest man, the wronged man. True or false, what do I care? It's enough if the world is saved. It's better the world should perish with truth than be saved with your lies. At the course of that salvation is the great worm, Satan. What is truth, says Paul? What is falsehood? Whatever gives wings to man and lifts a man a man's height above the earth, that is true. And whatever clips off a man's wings, that is false. I won't keep quiet. I don't give a hoot about what's true and what's false or whether I saw you or didn't see you or whether you were crucified or you weren't crucified. I, Paul, create the truth, create it out of stubbornness and longing and faith. I don't struggle to find it. I build it and I build it taller than man and that's how I make man grow. If the world is to be saved, then it is necessary, do you hear me, Jesus? It is absolutely necessary for you to be crucified and I shall crucify you, like it or not. It is necessary for you to be resurrected and I shall resurrect you whether you like it or not. For all I care, you can make your cradles in your miserable village, body, crown of thorns, nails, blood, the whole work is now a part of the machinery of salvation and it is all indispensable and you cannot stop it. Anybody here, uh, do you ever miss Rush Limbaugh? So you know who Rush Limbaugh is. I don't have to explain that. Yeah, you probably don't miss him. I miss him. I miss I'll tell the world I miss Rush Limbaugh sometimes, not very often, but I, I miss him when something big happens, all right? When, when, when President Biden dropped a drone on Zwahiri, bin Laden's mission planner, if Limbaugh had been around, I would have gone straight to him. I wouldn't have gone to MB MSNBC because I know what they're gonna say. I wouldn't have even gone to Fox because I know what they're going to say. I want to know what Rush Limbaugh is going to say because I know that he must crap all over it. <laughs> I know he's going to do that. I know what he's going to say. That's not the thing. I love language. I love words. I love stuff like that. And I always thought, how is he going to explain this to the faithful? See? And when January 6th came, I thought, Okay, he has to find some way to tell the faithful that what happened isn't what really happened. 
And when Mar-a-Lago got raided, he has to find some way to prove that that uh, President 45 is a victim, that this is unfair, and that it's perfectly okay to declassify documents by just thinking about it. I work for the Army. I have to take three courses a year about classified documents. You don't, class, you don't unclassify a document by thinking of it, or at least a guy like me doesn't, all right? Who was a reality winner tried that, and we know how that turned out for her. So I would want to know, how is he going to package this for the faithful so that they'll be OK? See, when, when uh, Obama sent the Navy SEALs after bin Laden himself and pushed the button on bin Laden, I learned a lot. I went to Rush Limbaugh because I thought, oh, he's got to crap all over this. But he didn't. The first day after that, he said, wow, men, you know, you much man, Hondo. You know, you, you did this amazing thing. And he, he said nice things about it. He didn't want to. He had to just choke on it. But he gave him credit. And the right wing media and his listeners jumped on him with both feet. They nailed his feet to the floor. And the day after that, he got back on message. He said that, that Obama owed American people an apology for killing bin Laden. Yeah, right? Well, how did he do that? It's amazing. Look it up. I'm running out of time, I'd love to tell you. But that is what he said. And Fox News got on message, and that became the narrative for Fox News. So the thing that St. Paul is trying to explain to Jesus in that book, and the thing that I learned from a lot of these talkers, is that you have to choose between becoming a brand or a truth teller. And when I say brand, I mean a brand like Coca-Cola or Cheerios, a brand that you seek out because it's that brand, and you like that brand. When you make that choice to become a brand, it's going to change you. Because when you make a choice to become a brand, you have to allow somebody to own you, to own you. But now, here's Here's the scary part, is that somebody owns you anyway. You are owned by the narratives that you tell yourself that define your story to yourself every day. Who are you? Oh, I'm a school teacher. No, you're not. Who's the person sitting in the chair who thinks they're a school teacher? Who's listening to this stuff right now? Who is that person? Everybody is, who becomes a brand is owned by somebody. Let me tell you how this happens. This is where the title comes from. This is also one of my favorite books of all time. This is called Fahrenheit 451. This is by uh, one of my literary heroes, Ray Bradbury. I really studied Ray Bradbury to try to get that sound that he has. So for those of you who don't know the book or haven't seen the movies, Fahrenheit 451 takes place in the distant future, actually very near to our time. And this was written in 1953 when television screens, if you remember that far back, were about the size of a hymnal. Now, that in this book, television screens are the size of a wall, an entire wall. And one of the status symbols that people seek is to have all four walls as gigantic surround sound television, just like virtual reality. Uh, the characters in this book are Guy Montag. Guy Montag is a fireman. In this 
narrative, firemen do not put out fires, they create fires. Their job is to seek out hidden books and to burn books and to burn the houses that those books are found in and if necessary, to burn regrettably the people who are in those books, which is one of the things that kind of changes him. He wants to know why people are willing to die for books. He's married to Millicent, his wife he calls Millie, and she is addicted to television. And she's also addicted to pills and tried to kill herself a couple times. So he's, as he's talking to Millie, he says, the bombers cross the sky, and they cross the sky over the house, gasping, murmuring, whistling like an immense invisible fan circling the emptiness. Jesus, God, said Montag, every hour, so many damn things in the sky. How in hell did those bombers get up there every single second of our lives? Why doesn't somebody want to talk about it? We've started and won two atomic wars since 2022. Yeah, it really says that. <laughs> 2022, you can look it up. Wow. We've started and won two atomic wars since 2022. Is it because we're having so much fun at home that we've forgotten the world? Is it because we're so rich and the rest of the world is so poor that we just don't care if they are? Millie, I've heard rumors the world is starving, but we're well fed. Is that true? The world works hard and we play? Is that why we're hated so much? Later on in that scene, Montag is leaving the house to go to work. And he's just had a big argument with Millie about books because Millie found out that he's been stashing books in the house because he wants to find out what the deal is with these books and the people who want to read them, even at the risk of their life. And Millie has found the books and she's upset, but he's walking out, she says, Mildred stopped screaming as quickly as she started. Montag was not listening. There's only one thing to do, he said. Sometime before tonight, when I give the book to Captain Beatty, I've got to have a duplicate made first. Uh, Guy, will you be here for the white clown tonight? And the ladies are coming over. Montag stopped at the door with his back turned. Millie? What? Millie? Does the white clown love you? No answer. Millie, does, he licked his lips, does your family, your parlor families on the wall, do they love you? Do they love you very much? Love you with all their heart and soul, Millie? He felt her blinking slowly at the back of his neck. Why'd you ask a silly question like that? He hesitated, listening at the door. He opened it and stepped out. So Millie thinks that's a stupid question. Actually, it's a really good question. Does Tucker Carlson love you? How about Rachel Maddow? How about Sean Hannity or President 45? A lot of people think President 45 really loves them. He says he does. Who loves you, baby? Whose are you? Who owns you? And if you think nobody owns you, it just means you're not thinking hard enough. You need to look again. Here's another passage. My hands are shaking. Faber is a literary or a literature professor who's gone underground to protect himself since books are no longer allowed. And he and Montag, Montag has showed up at his doorstep and he knows Montag is a fireman, so he's really scared of him. 
It takes a while for Montag to make his case that he wants Faber to teach him how to read. Well, now it's too late. Faber closed the Bible. Suppose you tell me why you came here. Nobody listens anymore. I can't talk to the walls because they're yelling at me. I can't talk to my wife because she's listening to the walls. I just want someone to hear what I have to say. And maybe if I talk long enough, it'll make sense. And I want you to teach me how to understand what I read. Faber examined Montag's thin blue face. How did you get shaken up? What knocked the torch out of your hands? I don't know. We have everything we need to be happy, but we aren't happy. Something's missing. I looked around, and the only thing I positively knew was gone was the books that I have been burning and burning for 10 or 12 years, so I thought books might help. Stop shaking. Faber says, but that would just nibble the edges. The whole culture shot through. The skeleton needs melting and reshaping. Good God, it's not just as simple as picking up a book you put down a half a century ago. Remember, Montag, the firemen are rarely even necessary. The public itself stopped reading all of its own accord. You firemen, you just provide a circus now and then, but it's a sideshow. So few people want to be rebels anymore. And out of those few, most like myself, they scare easily. Can you dance faster than the white clown? Can you shout louder than Mr. Gimmick? And if you can't, why would anybody listen to you? People are committing suicide. They're committing murder. Yes, Montag, but they're having fun and wars. Fun, Montag, fun. So here's my point. And if you've been daydreaming up to now, just hear this one thing. All right, because I know I daydream all the time. Brand, what is a brand? Tucker Carlson, to some extent, Rachel Maddow, whom I like, she's my brand. Rush Limbaugh, moral posing, moral posing, what is that? In the Bible, you know, we always talk about Jesus as being about love and compassion and Jesus loves the little children of the world and all that. Great. Real world, if you read the Bible, there were some people that Jesus really didn't like. The people, one of the people that Jesus really didn't like were moral posers, people who would stand on a street corner and beat their chest so everybody could see how religious they were. Very religious moral posers. When a person an otherwise moral person becomes a brand, you don't get that for free. You gotta pay for that. You have to pay something for that. In, in Shakespeare's play Macbeth, if you know that story, I'm running out of time, I won't explain it, but Macbeth has killed and betrayed a lot of people. There's a line where Macbeth says, I am in blood stepped in so far that if I were to turn and wade no more, Returning is just as tedious as to go over. That's what a moral brand is. You've invested so much in this image that even if you don't believe what you're saying, even if you stopped believing in what you're doing, you gotta keep doing it because the price to give it up is too terrible because you've gone too far. Moral courage actual moral courage, you don't get that for free either. That has a different price. Moral posing, you have to give up a piece of your soul every time you have to say something that you don't believe in. Moral courage means that you're probably gonna lose everything. The easiest example that you and I can think of right now, and some of you are thinking of this example right now while you're looking at me, is politics. We have been treated to the spectacle of moral posing and genuine moral courage. The moral posers have had to give up a piece of their soul 
to keep up a narrative about last, the last election that they know is not true. But for the sake of their careers, they have to keep saying it and saying it. And every time they say it, they lose a little bit more of themselves and they know it. And some part of them is crying out. And then you have those very few exceptions who know that they're going to lose their political careers, that they're going to lose everything that they've stood for if they speak the truth, if they speak out against it, and they did lose everything. But they do, a person of genuine moral courage gets something else. You don't get that for free, but you do get something in return. What you get in return is transformation. Transformation. Transformation, genuine spiritual transformation, you don't get that for free either. You have to pay for that. The way you pay for that is either through great love or great suffering, sometimes both at the same time. That is what creates transformation. And you can be sure that the politicians who have lost everything, even though their values are probably very different and their political views are probably very different from most of us, they have gained the experience of moral transformation through great suffering and great love and genuine patriotism. A moral poser loses a little bit of himself every time he has to stand up to the public and say something that he knows is not true but is in his interest. Like the people that Jesus used to get mad at. And by the way, those were the people who killed Jesus. And many of those people are the religious leaders of today. Moral courage will demand everything that you have. And in return, it will give you everything that you really are. So, what all this is about, transformation. Everything is spiritual practice. Your suffering is spiritual practice, but only if you suffer wisely only if you suffer with awareness. Love is also a source or of energy for spiritual transformation. If you can use that love to do the right thing, even if it costs you. This is why I say in your own life, when you find yourself getting out of control, drop the storyline. Go back to yourself. When you have a chance to to meditate, ask yourself, who am I? Who is the witness? Who owns me? I'm almost done, I swear. But I, I want to offer one thing, because I know that there are creative people in this room, including musicians. Uh, in the old days, I had a friend who used to write songs, and he wrote a children's song. And I looked it up, and this was his song, except that I don't remember any of it, except for one kind of verse. So if anybody likes to write children's songs, you may want to take this verse and own it and do something with it. This is the part that I remember, because he and I used to sing this part together. Uh, even the biggest liar in the world don't want nobody to lie to him. Even the biggest bully in the world don't want nobody to pick on him. Evil people want peace and love in their lives. Evil people want peace and love in their lives. Even the biggest killer in the world don't want nobody to kill him. Even the biggest joker in the world don't want nobody to laugh at him. Evil people want peace and love in their lives. Evil people want peace and love in their lives. Amen. Okay. Please join us for our closing hymn, Hymn 108, My Life Flows on an Endless Song.
Our closing words? Oh, we'll have a talk back here at 12.30. 15 minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, this is from Susan B. Anthony. Cautious, careful people always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing can never bring about a reform. Those who are really in earnest must be willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimation and publicly and privately in season or out avow their sympathy with the despised and persecuted ideas and their advocates and bear the consequences.